The human rights situation is worsening globally and that is why it's important that we hold all those accountable that violate human rights. Islam is the real problem that we face in the Netherlands, in France, in Belgium, in all of Europe. The independence of the judges in Hungary is one of the best in the European Union. <laughs> we need the tripod of democracy, respect for human rights, respect for the rule of law. Welcome to the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties, where we look at human rights and democracy issues from across Europe. On this episode, I'm joined by German member of the European Parliament, Sergei Legadinsky of the Greens EFA. Sergei has worked closely on two issues front and center on the EU's agenda, its relations with its eastern neighbors and the rule of law. As vice chair of the Parliament's Committee on Legal Affairs, Sergei has been closely watching the erosion of the rule of law in member states like Hungary and Poland. He's also the Green spokesman on Russia, where he was born and spent much of his childhood. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, he has underscored the importance not only of the EU's humanitarian mission and other support of Ukraine, but also the need for the bloc to untangle itself from Russia, economically and psychologically. I also spoke with him about the strength of the rule of law and democracy in the EU and why protecting it is important not only internally but externally as well. Sergey, you wrote an op-ed recently about our need to, quote, de-Putinize ourselves. And of course, you meant that in the sense that we need to wean ourselves from fossil fuels and other things Europe is dependent on Russia for. But you also, I think, meant it in the sense that we need to rid ourselves of this sort of inner authoritarian ideology. Putin is um, kind of reconstructing an ideology uh, which would be an anti-ideology, you know, anti-Europe. Uh, not in the sense that he hates Europe, but he constructs um, kind of a Miro, uh, anti-Miro <laughs> ideology of, of for itself. Uh, because during the 2008 war in Georgia, I said, um, I was actually quite, quite relaxed. I said at that moment, this is pure and only um, colonialism. And colonialism doesn't play good in, in the neighborhoods. There is nothing that, uh, that the Kremlin could offer at that point, except for this talk about the Russian speakers uh, in its surroundings uh, and, you know, alleged uh, um, genocide in Skhinvali then in Ossetia. Um, but then, uh, I don't think that Putin listened to what I said, but of course, they're not stupid. They, they realized that uh, they needed an ideology of their selves. And then they started adopting this, this, this idea of Eurasianism from Dugin, you know, this prof shady professor, and from many others. And then they kind of constructed this illiberal demo democracy and cultivated this illiberal democracy and kind of traditionalist uh, ideology that they have cultivated ever since. And that we started to borrow ourselves. I mean, look at how the term feminism is being perceived now versus uh, 15 years ago. I mean, I didn't... <laughs> how many people now would say that this is a... You know, that feminism is something terrible or that gender, yeah, gender, which is just an English word for, uh, you know, sex um, in the sense of, uh, you know, identity, um, is, has become... A, a, a fighting term uh, where the Bulgarian Constitutional Court ruled that the Istanbul Convention is against the Constitution because it speaks about gender. Where the Turkish, uh, the, you know, the Turks got out of the Istanbul Convention because they don't want to, to have anything to do with the gender. Word. What the hell? So this ideology, these scapegoats that the far right in Europe has created, the illiberalness of it all, you believe these are being borrowed from Russia? I mean, Orban didn't invent a liberal democracy as a term. This was an invention uh, in, in uh, the Soviet, you know, in, in Russia, in the Kremlin. Uh, they didn't invent, you know, this whole gender and LGBTI uh, hatred that they are propagating. Russia, uh, Russia did it. This was the laboratory for those things. 
Hungary and Poland stand out as two member states that are rather proudly illiberal. But it's not just them. Even in stronger democracies like Germany, the economic ties to Russia can be significant. And in some ways, they can serve to legitimize the overall relationship with Russia, even in the respects of of the social or, or cultural Putinization. So, um, and I, so I think that that we, the, the kind of the little Putins, and and you know our Putinization uh, basically started on on three fronts. Number one is this absolutely, um, you know, how, how would you say, devote um, um, economic submission. Uh, also in terms of our gas and energy, but also beyond that. Anything economic is good if it comes from, you know, Kremlin, it's good, it's money, it's, it's, it's economic ties, it's markets. Number two is um, our ignorance, just because we didn't watch, we didn't look into what was happening, people didn't understand. And I understand it's, 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 it's difficult if you don't speak the language to understand the nuances, but then listen to us. You know, we were dismissed as, you know, alarmists or, you know, um, those, those who are just, you know, spoilers. And number three is, um, uh, is an active uh, process of active borrowing um, of these ideological uh, components by uh, uh, our Hungarian friends, by our Polish friends, but also by many, many others in many in many uh, other um, member states and this is something where we should it should give us a pause um and and where we say okay of course the first thing is to to defend you know our um, allies and and to help ukrainians to defend themselves and to also try to uh you know to to have a counter strategy against putin but actually an integral component of what should happen now is to actually self-analyze and understand and how much we have become um, uh, emerged in, in, into, into this ideology uh, and, and have become part of it. And let's uh, start uh, getting rid of it in ourselves. One way we can start to get rid of it is through strengthening the rule of law and democracy at home especially in certain member states. And you've worked very hard to bring attention to ongoing rule of law issues across the EU. And collectively with other MEPs, you push the commission to make uh, internal rule of law and democracy issues more of a priority. I'd like to ask you about a couple of instruments and whether the EU has the tools it needs to do the job. The first is the annual rule of law report by the commission which is important to sort of take stock of where things stand across the block. When the first report came out in 2020, you were critical in that you felt that it wasn't forceful enough. Perhaps it was a good foundation, but but it lacked the teeth. And I'm curious what you think of this report now after a couple of cycles. First of all, I think that having a report like this is um, absolutely important. And um, um we have always supported the idea of this reporting i would say um um we we should though um maybe think about a a, a consolidation of different reporting instruments across uh the uh, various institutions of the european union um there was one proposal by our parliament i'm a shadow rapporteur on that to have a uh, what we call a rule, rule of law mechanism um, which would be kind of a consolidated um, multi-institutional uh, uh, reporting instrument uh, which would also include experts um, uh, opinions as well um, and would also and this is something that we've been pushing for by the commission that they not only uh, talk uh, about uh, certain problems, but also make recommendations, specific recommendations to respective uh, member states on what should be done, what is the problem, but also what is the solution that could be considered. And um, this is something that I think is probably the best teeth you can imagine uh, for this tiger, uh, which is lacking the teeth now. 
It does seem, however, that many of the problems in many countries are systemic. They are not improving despite the naming and shaming of the report. The problem is a little bit, it goes beyond this report. Uh, I think that, you know, when, when do this, did the idea of this report um, uh, come about? It was the time when we were looking for instruments on how to deal with the deficits in the rule of law area, in our values um, policy area. Um, and this was kind of the first starting point where we thought that through naming and shaming, uh, we will already... Uh, um, give enough incentives for states who don't want to be named and shamed uh, to change. I'd like to ask about media freedom here, and this may seem a bit tangential, but it's not really, because one way governments like Orban's in Hungary avoid a reckoning from voters at home is because they completely own the airwaves. There's no independent media, really, and all news outlets just repeat government propaganda and disinformation. It seems that protecting media freedom is necessary to protecting rule of law and democracy as well. There is a structural change that, that we're seeing at this point of history, and this is, you know, the dying out of the printed media and, and of interest in printed media, this whole um, digitalization of media, uh, which is making uh, the existence and the survival of uh, a number of media um, and outlets um, uh, and, 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 you know, media enterprises uh, basically impossible. And if we, you have a market which is dominated by strong and probably very well networked uh, uh, members, especially those close to the ruling party or the ruling government, then um, basically it looks like a natural extinction of media, but in fact it's uh, not very natural because it's uh, helped uh, by political bodies, by, by some oligarchs, uh, oligarchic structures, etc. And um, we need some structural um, safeguards against this. I think we, we, first of all, we need more transparency about media pluralism. Um, we do have pluralism indexes in, in some countries, uh, but we need to work a little bit better and more with that. Um, and also correlating to that, we need an anti-monopoly uh, action in the media, in the realm of media. I don't understand why um, European Union is big on, you know, all this anti-monopoly um, policies in all areas, but in the, in, the, in the realm of media, I don't hear much about that. So we need to activate this because this concentration of media in the hands of the few is basically concentration of media in the hands of the few close to the, the uh, the rulers, and uh, we see this in many countries. Number number two, I think, is important also to to find ways of providing financial support to media, um, and you know, having more foundations or pools where uh, where small uh, media enterprises would be able to um, basically sustain their economic activities. Um, this is not easy. Um, because we're intervening, of course, in markets, but uh, hey, we intervene on many, in many other issues also in markets, and this is an important and instrumental um, issue for any democracy. And um, uh, finally, I, I, I do think that um, we, we need uh, strengthening and securing public media. Uh, so, so um, you know, one of our proposals is to have kind of a public media of European Union. So going in a kind of an, in the direction of a, having a platform of a public media um, of European caliber would be something that could potentially also balance out this, um, um, yeah, this, this, this kind of skewed uh, a market, skewed towards um, oligarchic, 
concent concentration and concentrated media. So these are just a couple of things. And of course, protecting journalists, protecting them against assaults and, and against um, governmentally orchestrated um, attacks. This is something like the slap legislation with it, with that we're uh, uh, having here and expecting um, from the commission. This is, this is an, of, of extreme importance. Speaking of the commission, when member states essentially say, we don't care about the naming and the shaming, it's then a matter of what other tools are available to answer the issues identified in the report. The, the next step was, of course, to say, okay, well, let's let's start um, the, the 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 procedures that we have, right? So we have this Article Seven procedure. Maybe you will get uh, also concerned and uh, change your behavior. Well, what are we having now? We have an Article Seven procedure in two in two cases, which basically stuck. I mean, the the French presidency um, has relaunched uh, discussions, but those discussions, according to the witnesses, is just basically you know everyone you know twenty seven representatives are sitting and around a, a large table and just reading out their um, their speeches, and nothing happens either. So then, then the question was, what what now? And then this idea, which I think is actually a very good idea, uh, came about as to say, um, you know, we should go uh, to courts. And, and, and this, by the way, I, I applaud that this commission um, and, and um, yeah, basically this commission and the previous commission also to a certain extent, they've explored those, those possibilities and through, um, you know, Article 19, Article 16 of the treaty, they uh, Article 6 uh, of the treaty, Article 2, they basically, with the European Court of Justice, uh, actually triggered this possibility that actually this is something you can go to court about. And now we have a lot of rulings and the states still say, uh, what did you say? We, we don't care. Yeah, this is the... <laughs> Uh, I would say, you know, you would say, go mind your, your own business, uh, to put it in a, in a civilized way. Uh, and, and, and now the last thing, and, and this is very unfortunate, I think, that we get to that uh, point. But the last thing, uh, if, you know, naming and shaming doesn't work, if uh, procedures don't work, if courts don't work, because some of those states said say you know european law does, is not valid to us constitutional law is much more important to us than than european law um well then we came to this uh, this point where money should start talking the conditionality mechanism is a tool that could allow brussels to block some eu funds to countries that don't respect the rule of law and now that it has a stamp of approval from the court it's seen as really perhaps the best hope for holding countries to account are you optimistic that this could finally bring real change we actually originally and the commission by the way as well wanted a mechanism where it would just plainly say if you don't adhere to the to the principles of article 2 so to rule of law and, and fundamental rights then we can cut your eu funding um and 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 then the member states and probably the listeners and and yourself you remember this whole game where merkel had to uh, mediate between member states and the commission and the parliament uh, because they are basically some some member states like Poland and Hungary hijacked um, our budgetary uh, our budget and said you know unless you uh, uh, reform your original uh, ideas on on this very broad conditionality understanding we wouldn't um, allow you to move on with money for the COVID uh, emergency um, and then, uh, you know, there, I would have gone a different way, but whatever, things are like uh, as, as they are. Uh, so the result was that now you have this conditionality, which is limited to um, misspending of European money. Uh, so that means not just any uh, um, rule of law deficit or any infringement of fundamental rights would 
justify cutting the money. You have to actually prove, or the commission um, has to prove, that it, uh, there is an, a, a, a deficit in rule of law. Let's say the courts are not functioning properly. And because of that, European money uh, is spent in a wrong way. Um, so you have to, f to, to, to show that the money uh, uh, um, is spent in the wrong way through this rule of law deficit and that this money is European. That does seem like a lot to prove. That's a lot to prove um, and to provide evidence for, but, but whatever. I mean, in, in m many cases, like many experts say in the case of Hungary, this would be possible and feasible to activate this mechanism. Uh, but then uh, the European Commission started, um, you know, got some concerns because, of course, they also <clears throat> depend on member states. And when the member states, um, uh, Hungary and Poland, went to court because they said this this uh, this mechanism is not is not okay, it's not compatible with uh, uh, the treaty with understanding of European Union. Uh, then the Commission said, okay, we should wait until. Uh, the European Court of Justice has a final word on it. And it was not necessary from our perspective, uh, but um, um, it, it is, it, it, it happened this way, but because we thought that we're losing time and, you know, it, it's just, for us, it's just time for many of those NGOs or, or those people, um, it's, you know, one year of their lives that we've been waiting uh, uh, for this ruling. And that's why at some point the European Parliament said, you know, we're going to bring uh, an action, a court action against the Commission uh, for failure to act. Because, dear Commission, I mean, you have everything on your hands, but you don't act. Um, and then actually it was my role, because I was the rapporteur in the jury committee and the legal affairs committee, uh, when, when I brought this action to the European Court of Justice and now this action is ongoing. And to be honest, at the beginning I was skeptical because I thought, you know, the Commission is going to notify, as they call, they, they will start the procedure with one of the states. But now it's what, almost April? And we still don't have a procedure by the Commission. Now they're saying, because the most probable procedure is Hungary, now they're saying we should wait for the elections in Hungary in early April. Shortly after our conversation, and just two days after the Hungarian elections, the European Commission notified Hungary that it was triggering the conditionality mechanism. The Commissioner Hahn has today spoken to the Hungarian authorities and informed them that we will now send the letter of formal notification to start the conditionality mechanism. That was European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announcing the initiation of the mechanism on April 5th. The news was met with optimism that corruption and rule of law backsliding in Hungary might not go unpunished. And there's reason to believe Viktor Orban's government does care this time. This is basically the only instrument that I think and that I see that the me member states government actually are afraid of because this is about their money in their pockets and in and, 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 and some cases in their private pockets, like um, we assume in some private pockets in Hungary that is the case. But yes, I, I do have concerns that in a different geopolitical setting, we will not be able to focus so much on the issues of rule of law and kind of in the shadow of this uh, very legitimate uh, defense of Ukrainian and, and of our interests vis-a-vis -vis Russian authoritarianism, we will be feeding structurally structural authoritarianism amongst ourselves and we'll be closing eyes on that. This is a real concern. This is a dilemma, I would say. It's not, it's not an easy, there is no easy answer to this. But we, I think, should not forget that um, um, we have our own Putin and we should not be feeding our own Putin in ourselves. And by that, I mean, you know, we are all, you know, we are all human beings and, and human groups and human dynamics uh, tends to be authoritarian 
And uh, um, it's not just about the Putin and the Kremlin, it's also about Putin and us. And how are we able to, to uh, uh, tame it? That's it for this episode of the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties. My guest has been German MEP Sergei Lagodinsky of the Greens EFA. If you have any questions or comments for the show, send them along to podcast at liberties.eu. This has been a presentation of the Civil Liberties Union for Europe.